Good morning. Hey, there we go. You're awake. Right on. I know it's kind of hard this early. I sat there and woke up in like five more minutes. Please, just five more minutes. Well, I apologize. It takes me a little bit to get from A to B. As you can tell, I come with some assembly acquired these days. So you can laugh. If I make the joke, you can laugh. If you make the joke, you have to attend uh, sensitive, sensitivity training. So sorry, but that's the way it is. Well, good morning. My name is Brandon Byers. I'm retired senior airman, United States Air Force. I was an E-4. Yeah, there we go. Air Force. Who? Cool. <laughs> All right, so how many of you out there have members of the military or have been in the military? Raise your hands. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Round of applause. Come on. Right on. And while we're handing out applause, let's give another applause for Kathleen. It, doesn't take, it takes a whole lot to come up here and share something so intimate. So as I stated, I'm retired Air Force. What I did in the Air Force was I was security forces member. Does anybody know what that means? Anybody out there? Security forces. I was a military police officer. I know, I was a cop. Yeah, uh, I, was, I was Popo. I apologize. So I was a military police officer, so it was my job to enforce the rules, or other times enforce security rules on a flight line where they had all the jets, the top secret stuff, all the really cool stuff that I was never allowed to take pictures of. So, because if you did, they tend to tackle you and then erase your phone and then they erase your existence and this, that, and the other, and it just gets real bad real quick. So, anyway, I joined the Air Force in 2005. And then at that same time, right after I got to my first duty station, which was Nellis Air Force Base. Anybody know where that's at? Las Vegas, that's right. Yeah. I've never been to one Gamblers Anonymous meeting, I promise you. So, I was at Nellis Air Force Base, and then I got deployed six and a half months to my first duty station. Where I got deployed was called Camp Buka, Iraq. Anybody ever heard of it? It's been on the news a little bit. Camp Buka, Iraq is in the Basra area of Iraq, the southern tip, right around where the Gulf War was fought. Largest detainee facility in Iraq. When Abu Ghraib and a lot of smaller, place, smaller prisons got shut down, they shipped everybody over to Buka. So it made it a very hot target, a very dangerous area to be. And my job was I was attached to what's called ASO, or Area Security Operations. And what that meant was is I was outside the wire every day, all day, 17, 18 hours a day. I was what's called a 50 caliber machine gun turret gunner. Yeah. I got to sit there and operate the gun with a butterfly trigger, okay? I mean, just the manliest of man gun. And I have seen some women handle that gun, so don't think that only men can do it, because I've seen some women that could probably do it a lot better than I can, okay? Yeah, there you go, there you go. So my job was to make sure that my team was covered. All right, and just to give you a picture of what it looked like on a daily basis, my very first day, the team that we were replacing took us outside the wire and showed us the areas that we could go to and the areas, people that we could talk to, places we couldn't go and people we shouldn't talk to. So we had secured a convoy route and we were sitting underneath a bridge. And at that time, Iraqi police had just broken guard mount at their little police station and was going out to their little uh, checkpoints. So they were passing through our convoy. Now when they did this, at some point, at some time, somebody had pointed a gun at somebody else. And before I knew it, everybody was pointing guns at everybody. I had gun pointed at me, I had my gun pointed at someone else. Now unfortunately for that someone else, I had my rifle, I had my pistol, and I had that giant cannon. Well, I just turned the giant cannon on the one guy. So <laughs> his eyes were about that big, okay? That was, that was the kind of thing that you could expect on a daily basis. Now, we didn't have that happen every single time, but that was what the potential was, is that we were literally putting our lives on the line in order for what we believed in, for what we had raised our right hand to do. And what I mean by that is every person who serves in the military, who serves period, raises their right hand and swears to defend this country from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. Service is a big deal. And it doesn't just mean that you wear a uniform. A lot of times, you're a family member. And you're serving because you're supporting that person who is out there putting their lives on the line. What happened to me was five and a half months into my tour, 
I had got a chance to operate something that was called a CROWS, Common Remotely Operated Weapon System. Anybody played Call of Duty? I got to play it in real life, okay? Cro Common Remotely Operated Weapon System is a remote controlled 50 caliber machine gun operated by a joystick on a computer screen. The coolest toy ever, all right? And so I got to operate that machine the last part of my tour. Now, the day that I got hurt, I didn't actually operate it because it wasn't working that day. But it was a good thing that it didn't because had I been operating it, I wouldn't be standing here today. So five and a half months into my tour, on October 16, 2006, is when I got hurt. I was hit by a roadside bomb called an EFP, explosively forced or foreign projectile. What it is is it's shape charge aligned with copper, and when it goes off, it liquefies the copper. It goes straight through up armored equipment like a hot knife through butter. What it did was it went through my left leg, it went through my right hand, severed my ring finger on my left hand, and I got a pretty good bump on my head. When it went off, it was kind of like watching a war movie with the sound muted. I remember seeing a huge plume of dirt, a small orange flash, and then before I knew it, I woke up and some time had passed, and the tip of my left finger was dangling by some skin. It looked like a shotgun had been taken to my left leg, and I had a ginormous hole in my right hand where a piece of shrapnel had gone through my wrist, blew out my palm, taking with it bone tendon and clipping an artery. So I was bleeding out, and I was dying right there. But it was because of the focus and the training of the men and women that I served with that I'm standing here today, being able to talk to you guys. The reason I tell you that is because I want you to understand how impactful that was in my life. Literally, my life changed from one second to another. I went from having everything to nothing in no time at all. And I know a lot of people have their roadside bombs in life, okay? There's always going to be something in your life that absolutely obliterates everything that you've gone through before it. And it'll continue to happen because that's just life in general. I didn't know how to react. I didn't know what to do or if I was even going to live. I did live, and then I had to learn how to live with it. And it wasn't easy. And it was because of the men and women I served with. It was because of the people that I chose to have around me, my support system, and the people that came before all this who influenced me before that allowed me to be able to stand here and to be able to function, period. Because otherwise, I don't know what would have happened. And I always try to take this time to thank the teachers that I had because had I not had them and them not take the time to sit there and put an influence in my life and push me to push myself, I wouldn't be standing here because I wouldn't have made the decisions I made. Now, I'm not saying that you know, the teachers in my life caused me to have one leg, okay? That, that's not what I'm saying. You can be just like me. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I've done things in my life that I'm very proud of, and it's because of those teachers and the other people in my life that influenced me and, and guided me. So before you leave this school, before you graduate, just understand the impact that they've made on you. Because the impact they made on me allowed me to realize that I can make this work. Everything that you go through, you're going to trip, you're going to stumble, you're going to fall. And let me make this abundantly clear. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what happens to you. What matters is the manner in which you choose to react. It's the choices that you make after the fact that matter, that guide you on who you're going to be and where you're going to go. You can sit there and choose to let whatever it is defeat you and lay down and not do anything at all. Or you can choose to get yourself up, dust yourself off, dig in, and keep on pushing and realize there's something not only to learn, but something to accomplish. Because when you make that decision and you keep pushing forward, you realize that not only you're doing something for yourself, but you're doing something for others as well. Because now you've become the example to the examples. Because you've been through something, you have a story to tell and something that someone needs to hear in order for them to get through what they're going through. Someone could be going through abuse, mental or physical. Someone can be addicted to drugs. Someone could be so depressed that they're thinking about suicide. I've either seen it 
have gone through it or had my hand in it to help that person who was. You don't realize the effect that you have on other people when you make these powerful decisions. And you're going to have to make them. It's part of growing up. It's part of who you become, whether you choose to or not. So, what kind of decisions are you going to make when you leave here? What kind of decisions are you going to make when you walk out that door? What kind of people do you surround yourself with? Do they get you in trouble all the time? Do they sit there and get you to do the wrong thing? Basically, there's right and there's wrong. And a lot of times, the right thing is not the most popular thing. But when you choose the right thing, you know it's the right thing because it's the harder road to take. And people start looking at you differently. Because now you're making a stand. You're becoming something different. And that's what I am. I'm something different. Not something bad. I'm something different. Because of the choices that I've made and the people that I've been able to meet who influence me and hopefully the people that I'm able to influence, I like to say that I'm a game-changing, ripple-making force of nature. And there is no reason why you can't be that. None whatsoever. All it takes is a little initiative, a little determination, a little discipline, and belief in yourself. The biggest thing is, is take a trick out of my playbook, out of Kathleen's playbook, and understand that when you go from here, you give it everything you've got. No highway option. You become who you want to be, not what someone else wants you to be. Influence those around you. Make the right choices. Be around the right people because no one can make that choice for you. I want to thank you guys so much for allowing both of us to be here today. And hopefully something that we've said influences you when you leave that door. We really appreciate y'all's attention and ultimately just wanting to have this week and having us here. Thank you guys so very much. We really do appreciate it.